Okay, so hopefully you recall this question we were looking at above about taking a test. And we had two types of questions, type A and type B. And then we, we had set up a whole, um, uh, the, the constraints and we uh, looked at the object, uh, not the object, objective function, I'm sorry. Um, yes, actually we did, sorry. We had a number of questions, we looked at the feasible region, but then we added this extra condition that um, if type A questions are worth 10 points and type B questions are worth 15 points, how do we maximize our score? So we, we thought, saw this, worked this through as a linear programming um, problem. In fact, this was one we watched um, a different instructor um, talk about this. Um, so let's just remind ourselves um, of what we have. So we have our two variables. Um, I am going to adopt the subscript notation here, which is what's gonna happen now that our systems are going to be larger. So rather than using X, Y, and Z, we'll have X1, X2, X3, et cetera. So that way if we had four variables or five or even 10 variables, we can just do X1 through X10 and there's no worry about running out of letters. So uh, we're gonna use the subscript notation and just reword the whole problem using the new subscript notation. So we had these two constraints, right? This was the constraint on the amount of time we had and this was the constraint on the number number of questions we could answer. And then we want to maximize the number of points we could earn. So we had our objective function. Again, I'm gonna let it set equal to Z, um, even though the video you saw on this with linear programming didn't set this equal to Z, right? This was like, this is just, just, just an expression, but it's a new variable, they call it Z. And of course, the number of variables, I'm sorry, the number of questions of each type will be positive because we're talking about answering a certain number of questions. You can't answer a negative number of questions. Okay, so number 19 asks you, is this linear programming problem of standard maximum form? So I just copied and pasted from the book what hopefully you wrote down um, a little bit earlier in your workbook. So let's, let's go through these conditions. So is the objective function to be maximized? Yes, we are trying to maximize our points. So, yep. Are all the variables non-negative? Yes, we have that, right? Our, our X and Y or X and X1 and X2 have to be positive values. Do the constraints all involved a less than or equal to? And sure enough, they do. And finally, um, are the constants on the right side of the constraints all non-negative? And so yes, those are positive numbers. And so yes, this is of standard form and the explanation is what I just talked you through. So, um, or really it's just pointing to certain things above. Okay, so recall that the solution to this linear programming problem was accomplished by finding the maximum value of the objective function at each of the corners of the feasible region. And again, that was a video you watched with a different instructor. The solution was to answer 12 questions of type A and four questions of type B. That was the, that was the optimal solution, and that gave us our maximum value of 180 points. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna solve the same problem, but just using the simplex method. Um, and so to do that, we need to convert each linear inequality into a linear equation. So we're introducing this idea of the simplex method through a problem that we could already, we already know the solution to, okay? So um, we, we have to turn it into a linear equation, which means we want an equal sign. And right now we have less than or equal signs, right? So we have an expression that could be equal to 60, but more likely it's less than, it could be less than 60, right? So we introduce, so the first step for, for solving something by the simplex method is to introduce what's called these slack variables for each one of our constraints, for each one of our inequalities. So if three X1 plus six X2 is less than or equal to 60, then we'll introduce this thing called slack S sub one. So whatever amount um, 3x1 plus 6x2, however amount much that is less than 60, we'll just add s1 to it. So even though 3x1 plus 6x2 is less than or equal to 60, if it really is truly less than, then we'll, we'll allow the amount that it's less than to be s1. And so now this really is an equal amount. So this s1, our sort of slack variable, we'll pick up the slack of whatever, whatever is the difference between this expression and 60. Right? We know it's at least less than or equal, so you know we're adding some amount. Okay, so hopefully you understand what we're doing here. So there, we have a slack variable for our first inequality and another slack variable called S sub two um, for our second inequality. So again, the number of questions we answer has to be less than or equal to 16. So if we only answer, let's say 14 questions, then this extra slack will be two, right? So, but we know that it's gonna be some amount. Um, and so certainly S1 and S2 are going to be non-negative. They're going to be, um, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so we introduce our slack variables, and so now we can rewrite this linear programming problem. So what I'm gonna do is set it up to write it as a matrix. So we have our two constraints, but now our constraints aren't inequalities, they are equals, right? So we have three X1 plus six X2 plus S1 plus, really right here there's like a plus a zero S2 equals 60, and here X1 plus X2 plus 
0 s1 plus s2 equals 16. Um, and in fact, we're, there's really an extra variable here. So I left some space purposely so that we also want to maximize z. We have our optimization function. So I want to get it into the sort of same form as these two equations. So I'm going to subtract over the 10x1 and the 15x2 over to the other side. So this equation is equivalent to this equation, this objective function is equivalent to this, where I just subtract over negative 10x1 minus 15x2. So hopefully what you're seeing here is I'm starting to set up a matrix where I've got my x1, my x2 columns, then I'm going to have my s1 column and my s2 column, and then actually I'm going to have a z column, right? Okay, so uh, hopefully those are racing. Actually, I'm going to erase those circles. I don't actually think those are adding anything to this instruction. So, and then of course we do have the, um, luckily we have that all of our variables are positive, right? And that's of course important because we want this to stay in standard form, standard maximum form. Okay, so we rewrite all of those um, inequalities or equations, I should say, into a matrix and we call this the simplex tableau. And so, um, actually let's scroll back up for a second, right? So what we're seeing here is this is our X1 column, right? We have our three, and then in the next constraint, we have a one. And then um, we put a little dash here just to remind ourselves that the top portion are going to be our constraints written as equations. And then the last part is going to be that objective function. So the dash line just sort of reminds us that that's a different kind of equation. Okay, so hopefully you see how we translated this information right here into the simplex tableau. Okay, so except for the last entries, um, the the one and the zero. So other than so except for these, um, sorry, except for the one, uh, the rest of the um, sorry, okay, <laughs> except for the last entries, the one and the zero. So yes, I, I meant both of these um, on the right end of the bottom row. The the rest of the numbers in the bottom row of the simplex tableau are called indicators. So here are our indicators, okay. And so this is what's going to represent the coefficient for x1, x2, s1, and s2, our four main variables. Okay. So what we have done here is we've converted this linear programming problem into a system of three linear equations with five variables, right? That's why we have three rows and five columns. Since there are more variables than there are equations, we know the system is what we call dependent and will therefore have infinitely many solutions. All right, so we're not solving this, right? There's infinitely many solutions, but the goal instead will be to find a solution, find one particular solution in which all the variables are non-negative and where z, the objective function, is as large as possible, okay? So for example, as I, I'm trying to really emphasize, like there really are infinitely many solutions. So we can sort of think of like a really basic solution, the sort of easiest, most basic solution is like, well, what if we just let x1 equal zero and x2 equal zero? That's certainly gonna be a solution to the system because um, three times x1 plus six times x2 plus s1 could equal 60. So we would just make s1 pick up all the slack. s1 would be 60 and likewise here, s2 would be 16. And of course, but of course, z would be zero as well, right? So in the context of this problem, this is equivalent to saying, let's not answer any questions at all, right? And so certainly if you have zero questions answered, you're going to have 60 extra minutes of slack time. That's your S1. And you're going to have uh, 16 extra questions you could have answered, but you didn't. That's your, your slack too. But we earned zero points, so not a maximum. So it's a solution, right? All right so we, if we were writing this as like um, an ordered uh I don't know what the number for five is. So if we're writing this in order, all, all five values. Um, this is a solution to this matrix, to this system of equations, but it's not a good one. It's, it's in fact very bad. I don't want to earn a zero on this exam. Okay, so what we want to do is improve on this. So how do we improve on the solution? Okay, so let's think about what's happening. If we look back up here at this bottom row down here, um, this translates into this equation. What we have right now is negative 10x1 plus, I'm um, sorry, minus 15x2 plus z equals zero, right? So x2 has the most negative coefficient, right? This x2 term is the most negative. And so if we really want to improve z's value, we would do best, z will increase the most if x2 is increased, okay? So this leads us to what we're going to do next in the simplex method. So what are we going to do? So after you write this simplex tableau, which I've um, copied down again here, the next step is to find the most 
most negative indicator, right? So that's this negative 15. In this case, it's the negative 15, as I just said. Okay, so the most negative indicator gives us what's called the pivot column. So what I put in this box is called the pivot column, and it's because that's where the, the most negative indicator was. Um, now, for each positive entry in the pivot column, which happens to be the rest of the column, what we're going to do is divide the number on the far right. So divide this number, 60, divided by the number in its respective row. So 60 divided by 6 gives me 10, and I'm going to take 16 and divide it by 1 and get 16. And so I do that for every positive entry in this pivot column. And then of these, these quotients here, right, so this is my, these are my quotients, what I do is I choose the row with the smallest quotient. So in this case, that's the 10. And so my pivot row, my pivot row is going to be this first row. So I'm going to be pivoting on this number six here. This is in the pivot column and the pivot row. Um, and so I'll, I'll call this entry right here. This is my, this is where I'm going to be pivoting on the six. Okay. So again, the reason we're doing this is because changing this row, changing what happens to x2 is going to help increase our z value the most. Okay, so we found our pivot, pivoting value and now we pivot, we, we do this process called pivoting on this column and row. Okay, so what we wanna do is change this six that we had into a one. Okay, and then and so we're gonna use elementary row operations, which we've seen in earlier videos, in order to change this to a one and the rest of the values in the column to zeros. So this should feel really familiar. We've done this a bunch of times, right? We've, we've turned, um, in fact, often we were trying to get matrices of this form. So we're just doing this, we're just pivoting on this six. Okay, so we're gonna perform the following elementary row oper operations on this tableau in order to actually get this, um, get somewhere with this, this tableau. Okay, so the first um, I'll say round of pivoting is to get this to be a one, this to be a zero, and this to be a zero. So the first thing we're gonna do is just divide everything in row one by six, right? That's gonna, six divided by six is gonna give me my one. So three divided by six is gonna be one half. One divided by six is one sixth. Zero divided by six is zero, and zero divided by zero is still zero, and 60 divided by six is 10. So there's my first row operation. So I've accomplished the first task, which is to make this a one. Now I want to make this a zero, and I also want to make this a zero. So we'll start with row two. How do I get this term to be a zero? Well, I notice that in fact, these are both the same value. So if I just take the opposite of row one and then add it to row two and replace row two with that, that's gonna give me a zero, right? Because negative one plus one will give me my zero. Okay, so I'm gonna just first copy down the first row. So now this first entry, if I take negative one half plus one, that's gonna give me one half here. Negative one plus one gives me zero. Negative one sixth plus zero gives me negative one sixth. Negative zero or just zero plus one gives me one. Negative zero or zero plus zero just gives me zero. And negative 10 plus 16 will give me a positive six. So now I'm, I'm good with that zero. I, now I wanna change that negative 15 into zero. So I'm going to multiply the first row by a positive 15 and add it to the third row. Okay, so first let me just fill in the rest of the matrix. Okay, so now this third row, again, I'm taking 15 times one half, so 15 halves, and I'm adding it to negative 10. So 15 halves, minus 10 is like 15 halves minus 20 halves. Let's just write this for a second. This term is gonna be 15 times a half, and then I'm subtracting off 10, which I can think of as 20 halves. So this is gonna be negative five halves. And then in this next term, I'm taking 15 times one and adding it to negative 15, so of course I get that zero there. Now I've got 15 times the one sixth that I'm gonna add to zero. So that's giving me my 15, six, then 15 times zero plus zero is still zero. 15 times zero plus one is still one. And 15 times 10 is 150 plus zero is 150. Okay, so this round of pivoting is done since the pivot column is now just, and so I'm gonna actually highlight what was already written there. We have our one zero zero like we were looking for. So this round of pivoting is done.
Um, and now what we do is we sort of look to start all over again. Right now we look at our z value, we're trying to maximize it, right? But we still have a negative indicator. We have this negative five halves here. So um, if there are any more not negative indicators, we just continue another round of pivoting. Um, and so we're gonna keep doing this until we have no more negative indicators. Now this is a pretty small system. We only have two variables. So it's really just gonna take us these two rounds. But um, in general, this will take several rounds. Okay, so this next question is asking us to find the next pivot column and then the uh, pivot row. So we've already identified that the next, the pivot column is going to be this one since this is our only non-negative, our only negative indicator left. Um, and then what, what about the pivot row? So um, in this case, we're going to be taking uh, 10 divided by 1 half, which is the same thing as 10 times 2, we get 20. Or here, 10 divided by 1 half, I'm sorry, 6 divided by 1 half, so 6 times 2, which is 12. And we choose the smaller of the two, which is 12. So we're going to be pivoting on this 1 half here. So the question asks us to complete row operations to complete this round of pivoting. Okay, so I started copying down the um, simplex tableau, and I want this 1 half to be a 1. So what row operation should I do to make this 1 half be a 1? Well, certainly I want to multiply everything by 2. So I'm going to take row 2 times 2, and it's going to replace uh, my row. So 1 half times 2, that's our 1. 0 times 2 is 0. Negative 1 6 times 2 is negative 2 6, or negative 1 3rd. 1 times 2 is 2. 0 times 2 is 0. And 6 times 2 is 12. Okay, so now I just copied down the third row, and now I want to try to change both these values to zeros. So I'm going to start by trying to change this one half to a zero. So what row operation is going to accomplish that? Well, I could take negative one half times row two and add it to my row one, and that would replace my row one. So ideally, I'd like you to pause the video right now and try this. Okay, hopefully you actually paused it and worked it out as I did, um, and now you could double check your row against mine. Um, and then the last goal here would be to also make this term, this negative 5 halves, into a 0. So what's the elementary row operation that's going to accomplish that? Well, I can take 5 halves times row 2 and add that to my row 3 and replace row 3 with that. Again, um, go ahead and pause this video and, and see if you can do it yourself. No cheating. Okay, so hopefully as it says on the next page, hopefully you now have the, this following simplex tableau like this, and notice there are no negative indicators. Yay, so we're done. Okay, but how do we interpret this tableau into a solution? Like right now, this is a big old mess, right? So let's note that the last row of the tableau is the equation 5 thirds times S1 plus 5 S2 plus Z equals 180. Or solving for Z, we have Z equals 180 minus these two slack variables. Okay, so if both slack variables are zero, then the value of z will be 180. So that would be the, the most it could be, right? Because this if the slack variables were anything other than 0, we would be subtracting stuff off of that 180. Well, we want to maximize z, right? We want the most number of points. We don't want to subtract away any, any points, or we don't want to subtract away any time. We want to use up the full amount of time, the full number of questions we can. So it, we're going to let our s1 and s2 be 0, right? That's going to allow us z to be as large as possible. OK, then if we take the first row, right, look at this first row, we have that x2, 1 times x2, plus um, now 0 minus 0 is equal to 4. In other words, so x2 is equal to 4. And then the, similarly, the second row, we'd have x1 minus 0 plus 0 equals 12, so x1 equals 12. And so our solution would be when x1 is 12, so we want 12 questions of type, one, uh, type A and four questions of type B, and that would give us our maximum score of 180 points, right? So we see that the simplex method found exactly the same solution as what we found using linear programming and the feasible solution. Um, but this was, of course, a longer process, and unfortunately only gets longer with larger systems since we would need more rounds of pivoting. But it's just more time. It's not any more difficult than that. Okay.